Hi, everybody. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for that lovely introduction. Um, I'm really pleased to be here today to talk to you um, about people living with dementia. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. I have a few slides. So the first uh, test is just to check people can see my slides, if you can pop your hands up or say yes in the chat, that would be great. Um, and also there's a few uh, questions during my talk, or if you have um, questions or comments you want to make as we go through the slides, then please do pop them in the chat room um, and I'll do my best to keep an eye there. Um, and I'll respond um, as people's comments and questions come up. And there'll be time at the end, I think, for us to have more of a discussion. Uh, so as my introduction has said, I, I work at the University of Stirling, which is in Scotland in the UK. Um, so this is a welcome to Stirling, even though we're uh, just online virtually together. So the title of my talk, uh, today is Innovations in Understanding and Supporting Individuals and Families with Dementia. So during the talk, I will start by thinking about what we mean by the term dementia uh, and what I believe is, is a very important approach to understanding dementia as a, a complex and holistic condition briefly talk about the global impact of dementia, really just to underline why it's so important um, that we're thinking and talking about dementia. Then we'll focus on the experiences of people with dementia and what factors shape people's experiences. What is it um, that uh, makes them live well with dementia and what perhaps might hinder people from, from coping when they're given a diagnosis of dementia. Then I'll move on to talk about some innovative approaches that can be used by families, by professionals in terms of supporting people with dementia. And I'll talk quite a lot about what we do in Scotland. Um, we're very lucky in Scotland. We have um, a long history of, of research, of act activism around supporting people with dementia to live well. So I'd like to tell you a little bit about our human rights based approaches about ways that we support people with dementia and their families to participate and be involved in policy and in practice. And I'll talk about some more specific interventions. So I'll talk about meeting centres and I'll talk about music and dancing. And then as I say at the end of the presentation, there'll be time um, for questions and chat. So I actually wanted to start with a question for um, our attendees today. So just so I can um, shape my talk as we go along, but also I think for the interest of the seminar, it would be great to know um, what you all do and perhaps why you've come to this and why you're interested in dementia. So maybe you work in a healthcare setting um, or a social work or a welfare setting. Maybe you're somebody uh, with a person with dementia in your family. Or you might be an educator or a policymaker or something else. So it'd be really um, nice if you could pop into the chat uh, just a, a brief um, note of, of which of these groups you fall into or, or perhaps you come from, from another reason. And it really helped me in terms of um, where I kind of focus my detail as we're going through the slides. So when we're thinking about dementia, um, I really like this uh, quote from a research organisation in the UK called Alzheimer's Research UK. And it's a very straightforward way of understanding what we mean when we use the term dementia. So our brains control almost everything we think, feel, say and do. They also store our memories for us. There are illnesses that stop a person's brain from working properly. When a person has one of these illnesses, they may have problems remembering, thinking and speaking. They might say or do things that seem strange to others and find it harder to do everyday things. They may not, may not seem like the person they used to be. 
doctors use the word dementia to describe these different problems. Most people with dementia have Alzheimer's disease or vascular dementia, but there are other types of dementia. So dementia is the, the, the syndrome, Alzheimer's disease is a particular type of dementia. And currently it's the most common type. So why do I think it's important that we, we learn about dementia and that we talk about dementia? Um, firstly, the numbers of people around the world is increasing rapidly. This is very closely linked to increases in the, the numbers of older people. So populations around the world are experiencing what we call population aging. So there are fewer younger people in the population and there are more older people. Dementia is an age-related condition. So as we see more older people, um, we're almost definitely going to be seeing more people with dementia. So it's a growing problem and it's a global problem. Currently, most of the, the common forms of dementia are not treatable. So we don't have drug treatments um, that are able to uh, actually cure people of the underlying causes of dementia. There are lots of drugs in development and there's some very promising avenues of research. But currently, from a medical perspective, people can help. Uh, they, they, there may be um, medications that can help some of the symptoms of dementia, but at the moment we don't have a cure. And so it's really important that we think about other aspects of people's experiences. Um, and that's what my, my talk will focus on today. People with dementia and their families face stigma and understanding that often exacerbates the negative outcomes of having dementia. So they experience the symptoms of dementia, but without the general public and the wider public having clear and accurate knowledge about dementia, there's a lot of um, issues around stigma and around stereotyping and around misunderstandings. But that in a way is, it's not positive, but it gives us something that we can do. So we can work to make the lives of people with dementia better through things like addressing stigma, challenging stereotypes, and, and thinking about dementia in a more holistic way. So I'm just checking the chat. I don't think anyone has typed up um, what their background is. So what I'll do is I will continue to give some more detail about dementia, but I'll go through these slides a little bit more quickly and get on to what I hope is the more interesting bit towards the end. So just to underline that dementia is a physical illness. Um, it's, it's caused ultimately by organic changes in people's brains um, and the changes can be seen on brain scans. As I said, dementia is a syndrome, it's not a single disease, so there's lots of different types of dementia. Memory loss is a significant symptom and it's often the one that people are most aware of, but it's not the only one. And some kinds of dementia um, cause different changes in the way people think and do things. Um, but memory loss is kind of known as the, the, the most obvious symptom. There are reversible types of dementia. So people can appear to have um, the symptoms of dementia, but they can be caused by things like depression, side effects from medication, thyroid problems, vit vitamin deficiencies and infections. So it's always important um, to engage with a, a medical practitioner to make sure that uh, the symptoms of dementia are not being caused by any of these reversible uh, conditions. And then I've just listed a few of, of the types of irreversible dementia, um, but there are over a hundred of, of these, so we won't list them all. We've been learning a lot recently um, about risk factors that cause dementia. So one of the, the big areas of research is looking to see if we might be able to prevent people from developing dementia. Because if we can do that, then people are not going to get dementia in the first place. Um, and, you know, that's got to be a good thing. So we know that age is a risk factor. And unfortunately, there's no cure for age at the moment. We're all getting older and that's OK. Um, genetics, so some forms of, of 
dementia might have a gen genetic component, maybe hereditary, but that's a very complex picture. And there are very, very few types of dementia and they're very rare where there's a kind of direct link due to gen genetics. Cardiovascular health is um, a clear link, particularly to vascular dementia. We know that early life trauma can and leave people with um, higher risk of dementia, depression, diabetes, hearing loss in midlife, and um, excessive use of alcohol. So while there are a good number of, of risk factors for dementia, these are also positive messages in, in that they give us um, roots for change and roots for hope. As I said, memory loss is, is often seen as the, the, the core symptom of dementia. But as we get older, um, people do become a bit more forgetful and that's just a normal part of aging. Uh, and uh, we can all experience that. But dementia is um, a condition that isn't normal part of aging. It's something that we need to, to think about and we need to engage with. So. You know, if you find yourself making the odd bad decision, missing a payment for something, losing your keys, uh, sometimes not being able to find the word that you want to say, these are just all normal parts of life and we can all um, experience them. But if if you're noticing somebody may be having difficulty maintaining a conversation, if they are forgetting the day of the week or, or finding it difficult to track what data is, if they're frequently losing things, or if you notice things, perhaps they're unable to, to manage their finances or budgeting. So those might be some of the signs when you start to think, OK, maybe this isn't um, a normal part of aging. Maybe this is time to, to uh, engage with uh, a health professional and get some, some further support. So those were... Um, it's just a sort of overview introduction of, of dementia so that we're clear on, on what we're talking about. But my research and my interests are very much about how people with dementia experience their everyday lives um, and what we can do to uh, support them in their lives and help them achieve a good quality of life, helping them to live well. So when somebody is diagnosed with dementia, when they start to live with dementia, um, they can experience a range of symptoms that are presented in the various biomedical definitions of dementia. So things like uh, cognitive impairment, so that's affecting your memory, your thinking, um, your orientation in space, the way that you comprehend what's happening or what somebody's saying to you, things like calculation, learning and language. So these are the symptoms that we define in a kind of biomedical way. They can be very varied. Um, for each person with dementia, they may experience a different set of symptoms and um, uh, it kind of uh, demonstrate them in, in very different ways. But what comes along with that dementia and what can actually become more uh, negatively impactful for the person other changes in their social lives um, and in their personal lives caused often through misunderstanding and stigma around dementia. So we know that people with dementia experience isolation and loneliness. We know as dementia progresses, they lose their social roles. So often they may have had, you know, they may be a grandmother that cares for grandchildren or, um, you know, and these kind of roles start to be taken away from people. It becomes very hard if you're still in employment to, to maintain a job. Um, so as people lose these, these important parts of, of who they are as a person, the things that they, they um, the roles that they have in life, both socially and at work. We know that people with dementia, social networks tend to shrink. So they have less people um, involved in their, in their everyday lives. And these changes for the person, you know, can lead to lack of confidence, loss of self-esteem, um, and they find themselves further stigmatized and uh, excluded from the lives they used to lead. And for me, it's these aspects of dementia that can be more impactful 
for a person's everyday life than the actual uh, kind of biomedically de defined symptoms. So for my work and my research, it's all about focusing on on these kind of everyday and more social aspects of, of somebody's life. So I've put this quote in here from um, a leader called Christine Bryden, who was diagnosed with dementia and has written a lot about her own experiences of being a person with dementia. Um, and she uh, calls out for people to reject the, the negative um, stigma and stereotyping around dementia um, and, and calls for her still to be valued. Um, as a, a full member of, of society. And I think the fact that this quote's written by a person with dementia um, just increases the, the power of its, of its message. So coming to um, ways that we can help and support people with dementia um, and how we can understand how to make, make lives better. Um, we've got a fictitious uh, person with dementia. So what, what influences them when, when, when they've had their diagnosis, when they're living with dementia? So of course, the biomedical changes in somebody's brain are going to be um, impactful on their lives, that we, we need to understand what's, what's happening. Um, so that's where we need the support from the medical professions to understand the, the nature of dementia that the person has and, and the course that it may take. But somebody's family and community also play a huge role in their experiences of dementia. So family caregivers um, who often provide the majority of care to a person with dementia, um, they might be their spouse, their partner, their, their daughter or son, but they need support as well. They need to be they, they may find caring for, for somebody with dementia to be uh, stressful, to, to also be very impactful. So we need to think about not just the person with dementia, but we need to think about the family support that they have and also the support that those people might need. People with dementia, you know, who have strong social networks, who are linked into their community, who have the opportunity to be part of community activities, to be part of their neighbourhoods, um, are going to have lots of positive experiences and that's going to really help them. Um, so we, we need to think about how we keep people with dementia connected to the family, connected to the community. How do we prevent them from, from experiencing isolation and loneliness? Where people live um, is also very important. So the physical environment around them, um, there's a huge amount of research going on about how we can improve physical environments. Now that might be about accessibility. It might be about kind of clear signage so people can, can find their way about so they know where they're going. Um, or it might be about the kind of the design of spaces, making sure that um, there aren't uh, hazards on the ground for people to trip over. Um, we know a lot about uh, how people with dementia see things and some, some forms of dementia, there's a visual disturbance. So there's lots of, of ways we can adapt uh, people's physical environments to, to support them to live well. This is a picture of the Scottish Parliament, so not in Singapore, but um, the policies and the, and, and the legislation in, in our countries also shape people's lives, whether there is a uh, uh, welfare state, can they access care? Um, is there a, a formal, uh, is there availability of, of formal care services? Um, so the policies and ways uh, kind of political structures in our countries also influence people. Are they able to access funding for care? Are they able to access financial support? Um, so the next thing is, is around finances, obviously, People with dementia may have to give up work. Um, the people that care for them may also have to give up work or, or cut down on their hours. So how do, do we support people um, financially? So all of these different aspects are all influencing um, how people with dementia live and their ability to live well. And then the last thing that's really important is, is the person with dementia's life story. 
So understanding and connecting with who that person is and who they've been. Um, people's lives are a great resource and a great comfort to them. And, and understanding um, the life history that people bring with them is another great resource that we can tap into when it comes to supporting people with dementia to, to live well. So I'm going to move on now and talk a bit about some of the initiatives going on in Scotland. Um, and I wanted to start with this notion of uh, a rights-based approach. So this is something that's emerged in Scotland over the last 10 to 15 years, um, not just in Scotland, but across a number of countries. Um, and it's thinking about uh, the human rights of people with dementia. And that's about ensuring that they are full citizens in our country, that they are able to participate and be part of their lives in a meaningful way. And in Scotland, we have a lot of people with dementia who work as activists, who develop, uh, uh, who campaign on behalf of people with dementia and who talk to politicians and who speak at conferences. And I'll talk a bit more about them. Um, but they came up with a charter of rights for people with dementia living in Scotland. And this is something that shapes the services and support that we deliver here. Um, and they're very straightforward um, and they've been written by people with dementia. So we feel that they are pretty much, uh, they're gonna be true. So I have a right to a diagnosis. So we know um, around the world that diagnosis rates of dementia are very low, but we know that when somebody gets a diagnosis, it opens up uh, opportunities for support and understanding. But we also understand that sometimes a diagnosis can bring um, stigma and stereotyping. So when we talk about supporting people to have a diagnosis of dementia, we need to be careful that we're also ensuring that we're, we're presenting positive images, that we're challenging stereotypes, um, and that we're providing that diagnosis in a way that's going to be helpful. But once people have a diagnosis, they can start to understand what they're experiencing. And people with dementia tell us that's very important, that the diagnosis has taken away some of the worry that they maybe had if they didn't really understand what was going on, why their memory was getting worse, why they were finding themselves in difficult situations. So the diagnosis can provide an explanation and it can, can provide kind of avenues for them to, to start to live well again. Be regarded as a unique individual and treated with dignity and respect. So this is something that I think we all want and deserve for everybody. But sometimes when people uh, get dementia, uh, we assume because they don't remember as well or they don't appear to think as clearly, sometimes we can forget um, that they, they need dignity and respect and they should be seen as a, a unique individual. Access a range of treatment, care and supports. Um, in my previous slide, I showed how, you know, that care and treatment and support might be about where somebody lives. It might be about care for their partner, their caregiver. It might be uh, biomedical treatment. It might be um, some sort of community group that enables them to stay connected into their community. Um, and, and as dementia progresses, that, that care and treatment will become more about um, supporting that person, perhaps with personal care um, and with looking after themselves in their, in their everyday lives. Be as independent as possible and included in my community. So people with dementia want to continue really to live the lives they've always led, but they understand that they may need more support to do that. And we need to, to look at ways we can provide that support. Have carers who are well supported and educated about dementia. So this is both unpaid family carers and um, formal carers in, in care settings. And we know that, that these are groups of people that need to be educated about dementia. They need to understand the condition. And we know that with understanding, um, certainly in healthcare settings, you know, where, where workers have better knowledge of dementia, they're able to better deliver, they're able to deliver better care and they also don't experience the same levels of, of burnout and stress. 
So education and, and knowledge is really important. And end of life care that respects my wishes. So most um, of the underlying causes of dementia are um, fatal conditions, but dementia is a progressive condition and people can have dementia for, for um, 10 or 15 years. Uh, they can be quite slow in terms of the way that they progress or, or even longer. Um, but we, there will come a time where, where people need to think about um, their wishes uh, at end of life. And because dementia is that progressive condition where people's cognitive ability might change over time, those wishes and conversations about end of life probably need to take place earlier, um, perhaps around the time of diagnosis, so starting to think ahead um, when people are ready uh, to talk about end of life wishes. So I mentioned uh, participation um, and we use this word co-production. So that means when we work together with people with dementia and with unpaid family carers to try to campaign for better services and also to influence how services are designed and the kind of services that are set up. So in the UK, we have a network of groups that are called DEEP, which is the Dementia Engagement and Empowerment Project. And they are groups of people with dementia all across the UK um, who come together uh, to do uh, work that they want to do. So some of them um, campaign uh, with the politicians. Some people create groups within their local communities and work with local um, uh, municipalities to try and make, make lives better. The Scottish Dementia Working Group is a similar group in Scotland and Dementia NI is a group in Northern Ireland. So across the UK, um, we have more and more people with dementia and unpaid carers starting to really engage um, in a very meaningful and active way in educating people, in challenging stigma, in conducting research, creating peer-to-peer -peer resources and influencing policy and practice. So we're starting to hear that voice of the person with dementia who's enabling us to really understand what their experiences are like. And these are some of the publications that these groups have, have written. So these are people with dementia um, identifying issues that are important to them and then working together to, to create publications. So we've got one around um, youth traveling safely, uh, one around sensory challenges. So some people with dementia um, experience visual disturbances, um, have issues with hearing. So that was a really important booklet that was written by a person with dementia who has those sensory challenges. Um, and then we have more uh, lighthearted things. So we have a recipe book here created by one of the, the groups of people with dementia in Scotland. Um, healthy, uh, I think it's healthy recipes, um, because as we learned earlier in the talk, cardiovascular health is, is a risk factor for dementia. So eating healthily and living healthily um, is, is really important. Um, so you can see uh, the kind of range of, of activities that people with dementia are, are coming up with. And I think because these books are written by people with dementia, others are, are, are more willing to engage and interested to read it because it's a real life um, experience that's, that's being shared. When we think about human rights, um, in, in, as we do in Scotland, there's also a kind of a more, there's the, there's the community side and, and the staying connected and, and being part of your life. But there's also, um, there's also rights around accessing services, uh, receiving care, um, paying for care, understanding uh, what welfare or financial support you might be um, eligible for and also making sure that when you when you visiting when you're in hospital or you're accessing health care or you're accessing social care that you're getting the care that that you need um, so this is a service run by Alzheimer's Scotland which is our um, national Alzheimer's charity um, and they have a helpline where people can phone in and get advice on these kind of very practical aspects of living with dementia so pe helping people if they have a complaint about the service they've received, um, 
understanding some of the legal aspects. So we have um, processes called power of attorney and guardianship that can come into place when people with dementia are unable to uh, take care of their, their own um, legal and financial business. So that's a really important resource for families, particularly. We have this uh, new model of, of community work called the meeting centres, and these are um, drop in and day centres that are very much based in communities, housed in a community building, staffed by people from the local community. And they offer opportunities for people with dementia to come together, um, to do activities together, to design things. So the, and the, the activities that take place in the meeting places are very much um, influenced by the people with dementia themselves. I'm not exactly sure what's going on in this one. It's just a dancing day, I think. Um, they seem to have rubber gloves on. I don't know if they've been doing um, a kind of project around uh, housework or something. but. Uh, so yeah, so we, we're starting to see these meeting centres come up, which are very community based and they're all about people, people with dementia and their unpaid carers uh, being able to access support and take part in activities within their local communities. So addressing those issues around loneliness, around the loss of social connections and the diminishing of social networks. And I wanted to finish my my talk by talking about music. Um, so music is a is one of the uh, avenues of research or areas of research that's really, really um, popular when we come to thinking about how to support people with dementia to live well. Music is something that engages everybody and that it, when we are engaging with music, we don't engage with it simply as a cognitive process. We engage with music um, on a very emotional level, um, we engage with music as something from our life story. Songs and music can be very personal to us, being connected to memories. Um, we engage with music in a, a physical or bodily way. We can dance, we can sing, clap. Um, so music offers a way to connect with people with dementia in a really meaningful way. And music is something that will continue to be um, useful and, and impactful for people as dementia progresses. Um, so there's a, a, a large body of research around, around music and dementia. And some of the, the positive outcomes that, that are reported are improvements in communication. Um, some people um, come alive with music. They're able to communicate their feelings much more easily through music. Improvements in people's well-being and quality of life increased social connection, increased confidence and self-esteem, and also physical fitness and strength. So we can see how music encompasses some of those different risk factors we were reading about for dementia, um, and also some of those impacts are, uh, in terms of social networks and social isolation. So I was very lucky a few years ago to be involved with a project with our opera, um, society in Scotland. So we have a national opera society called Scottish Opera, and they've now been running a project called Memory Spinners for, uh, I think, five or five or six, maybe even longer years. And this is a, a, a pro an opportunity for people with dementia and unpaid carers to come into the opera and they work with the singers, the set designers, the dancers, the musicians, the composers. Um, and it's a, just this incredible creative process. Um, where everybody gets involved um, and it, I think they have a number of weeks where they have practices and development sessions and then there's always a performance at the end so they get the opportunity to be on stage um, and to perform their, their opera um, to, to an audience. Uh, and when I did the, the evaluation of, of, of the first round of, of this project a few years ago um, we saw all of those improvements we were talking about with music. People improved confidence. They loved being part of a group. They made friends. They made social connections. They became physically stronger from the dancing and the singing. And they also found that people saw them in a different way. So they were no longer um, 
a person with dementia, somebody that was failing, somebody that was losing things. They were seen as a performer, a singer, a dancer, and they were their their families and friends were able to to kind of see them again as as a whole person. Uh, and there was lots of joy in the sessions. What's one of the most lovely things about it? Um, and this is just a quote from from an unpaid carer talking about um, uh, the impact of the session. So I'm aware we've still got quite a lot um, to get through. Um, so I won't go through that in too much detail, but I just wanted to say what was really wonderful about this project was the involvement of the professionals, so the professional singers and musicians. It gave the people with dementia such a feeling of worth and self-esteem to be working alongside these, these amazing people. And they also loved the performances, even though it was pretty scary. Um, they, they really enjoyed um, that opportunity to be up on a stage. And then I found this paper uh, from Singapore, so uh, a project around uh, person-centered dancing. So um, working with people with dementia um, to try and tap into to what makes them happy using music and dance as a way to do that. Um, and showing significant improvements in, in quality of life um, as a result of the project. And then I just wanted to finish with a couple of projects undertaken by a colleague of mine called Claire Garabedian. Um, and Claire is a, a cellist. She plays the cello um, and did uh, a, a lovely project around uh, playing her cello to people with dementia who were towards the end of their lives. So they were living in care homes, um, approaching the end of their life. And she would sit in the room with them and play her cello uh, live. Um, and she taught, yeah, sorry, I'll, I'll, two minutes, I'll be done. I didn't realize I was gonna talk for so long. Um, and she just focuses on the way that music um, fulfills these human needs for inclusion, comfort, identity, occupation, and attachment. How music can really, really tap in to who we are as, as human beings. And also, um, she has an example of using it when somebody with dementia became so agitated and frustrated and, and upset, um, was able to, she was able to, to connect to them and calm them and bring them down and back to themselves through, through playing her music. So thank you. Um, apologies for, for going a little bit over time. Okay, hi, I'm Stealing. Um, I think uh, uh, people who interest who attended today are very interested in our program or interested in what uh, Prop Louis shared about dementia. And I think uh, without further ado, we'll touch on what uh, we have to offer here in, in Singapore. Okay, I'm, I'm based in uh, SIM I'm from the University of Stirling. I run the programs here in Singapore. Uh, this year marks our 11 year of partnership with SIM. So yeah, we are not new in Singapore and we have been running MBA since the 1980s. So yeah, we're pretty uh, experienced here in this area. But of course, this uh, dementia program, the gerontology and dementia program is new here. We launched it this year. So hopefully you guys can join us in the program if you're interested. Okay, the university is founded in 1967. So this makes us about 55, 56 years old. And we are reading research university in we are sorry, we are leading research university in research excellence and sporting excellence. So uh, most of our uh, MB, uh, sorry, the bachelor's degrees are all uh, centered around here in marketing, media and sports. Uh, but of course, we are not uh, that, um, how should I say, not that undeveloped in the postgraduate level, if you can see it. Sorry, can we go to the next slide? I just can't flip the next slide. Okay, so we are ranked top 20 for postgraduate teaching in the UK and 49 overall in the Guardian University in 2022. And we're also top 20 in nursing and psychology according to the Times and Sunday Times Good University Guide 2023. So this is uh, what we achieved uh, this particular year. And of course, we are also uh, have five-star rating for teaching, research, and priority, internationalization, and inclusiveness and facilities. Yeah. So, this gives you a flavor of what we do in Singapore, how we do it, and how well we do it. So uh, I have not nothing more to share. I'll pass on to Professor Lewis to share more about the details of the programs. Thanks, Elaine. 
Um, so yes, we're really excited to talk to you about our, our MSc Gerontology and Global Aging. Um, so I am one of the lecturers on the course. I teach a module on dementia in the second year. Um, but the programme lead, Professor Catherine Hennessy, is also with us on the session today. Um, so I've said I'll do the talk, but if I miss anything, Catherine will um, pop in and, and add a, a little detail. Is Catherine able to speak on the call? I'm hoping she can be unmuted. Yeah, so the University of Stirling, um, we're home to the Dementia Services Development Centre um, that's been around uh, for oh my goodness, nearly 30 years now, I think we've been doing research in dementia and aging. Um, and it's an international centre of knowledge and expertise. And we work internationally, working with uh, service providers, academic institutions and, and governments. The University of Stirling has a very international focus. We have um, a very international alumni and student body, um, but we're also um, a very applied university. So when we're teaching, we, we're, we're engaging practitioners, professionals, businesses, and we're thinking about your learning uh, in terms of how it can help you uh, in your employment or in your everyday um, work. So um, while we have a strong theoretical base to our teaching, particularly in this program, um, it's also very applied. So the learning you get will be useful because um, uh, we like to, to, to think about impact, we think that to think about uh, what our students are going to gain from the programme and what will be useless, useful for them. Um, the programme also provides a foundation pro for progression to doctoral studies. Um, so we have a PhD and professional doctorate opportunities in ageing and in dementia. Um, so I think, yeah. So if we go to the next slide. So the MSc Gerontology and Global Aging, as I said, is a theoretically based but applied programme. So we're looking to engage students who are working um, perhaps in policy, who are perhaps already doing research, but also particularly people that are in practice. That might be healthcare, that might be social care, um, it could be any aspect of healthcare. I think any of the kind of allied health, psychology, uh, speech and language, physiotherapy. I think all of these these fields um, will be supporting and caring for people as they age and for older people. Um, and so the course is designed um, to provide uh, that specialist knowledge around aging and gerontology that, that can then be applicable um, in these different professions. Um, People who are who are in business, perhaps running uh, a care company or, or other types of organisations relevant to ageing and older adults. And it's also a programme with uh, enough introductory level uh, material in it that if you were wanting to move in to ageing as, as your specialist area, this programme would, would give you a, a, an excellent grounding um, to, to move into that area. Thanks. So these are the, the learning outcomes from the programme. So on completion of the programme, students will be able to demonstrate detailed knowledge of gerontology, global issues and initiatives and policy and practice in the field of ageing. Have a critical understanding of the principal theories and research methods used with gerontology and ageing studies. So that really important theoretical understanding. Apply extensive detailed critical analysis to global ageing issues using local and international examples. So that applied, so we're learning the theory and we're applying it. And then develop knowledge and skills that can be utilised within healthcare practice settings and policy or business areas associated with older people and ageing populations. So it's that really important mix of theory and practice. Thanks. So this gives you an idea of the structure of the course. Um, so it's a two year program. Uh, you study two modules in each of the, the semesters. So you start off with an introductory module interdisciplinary perspectives on aging. And that really gets you uh, into and to grips with the, the subject of gerontology and understanding um, the, the range of disciplines and perspectives that help us engage 
with the aging process, with understanding the experiences of older people. And you also pick up a research methods module in that first uh, semester, which sets you up in terms of working towards your project at the end of, of the programme. Your second semester, uh, we have a life course approach to healthy aging, so thinking about aging from a life course perspective. We don't just suddenly age at one point in our lives, but it's a process and, and how we understand uh, kind of our experience as older adults through that, that lens of life course. And then we have a module that focuses on frailty, um, which is uh, very common conditions, people uh, age and something that, that requires uh, an in-depth knowledge and, and examination. Moving in to uh, the second year, um, we you look at multimorbidity. So again, looking at um, a kind of health aspect of, of aging and also do a module uh, around living with dementia, which is the module that I deliver. And then in the final semester, you do a module on housing. So thinking about the environment and people's housing and how that impacts on, on their experiences as they age, and you undertake um, a dissertation project. So next. Yeah, um, so just a very quick overview. It's a 24 month programme, it's part time, two modules in each term or semester. Uh, it's 180 credits, which is seven 20 credit modules in one project. The, I guess the, the important thing to take home from today is that it's a blended programme. So there is an online component taught by the Sterling staff, but what you'll get by coming through through SIM is um, you'll get face-to-face in-person tutorial support by qualified associate lecturers here at SIM. Um, so you get that best of both worlds. You're getting um, the, the Sterling expertise in, in, in aging, complemented by uh, local uh, qualified associate lecturers who can provide you with a more local context and understanding, but also that opportunity for face-to-face -face learning. Thanks. So I think, yeah, I'll pass back to, to cover the admissions criteria. Okay, uh, thanks, uh, Louis, Professor Louise. So for the admission criteria, it will be actually a minimum of a second class honours bachelor's degree. So experience of working with uh, older populations in the healthcare sector, uh, policy or business setting is actually recommended. So if you have any other qualifications, feel free to uh, uh, reach out to us because uh, we will actually be reviewed by case by case basis and subject to uh, interview by the university. So for the English language requirements, uh, if your degree is not obtained in English, you are required to meet the below uh, following uh, requirements at LX 6.5, then also present tests or other equivalent. The program fee for our September 2023 intake, the application fee will be $97.20. The program fee is actually $30,240. So this is inclusive of 8% GST and it's actually payable on a modular basis before the module commence. So for our details, you actually can refer to our SIM website for more information. So the important thing to take note is the application closing date will be actually 8 of May. So the class commencement is actually September 2023. So should you be very keen to apply for the program, please take down this email address, he3 at sim edu.sg and we'll reach out to you as soon as possible. 